Hello, and welcome to today's special event, How to Leverage DNS to Get Your Security Program Under Control, brought to you by Ziff Davis B2B and Cisco Umbrella. I am Karen Bannon, and I'll be the moderator. We have just a few quick notes before we begin. Slides will advance automatically throughout our event, and in addition, the console you're looking at is customizable. This means you can move and resize any of the widgets you see open, as well as explore the widgets at the bottom of your screen. For instance, you can find links to information resources as well as a free trial in the Resources widget. We'd like the event to be as interactive as possible, so at this time we invite you to ask any questions you may have using that question box on the left side of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the event. And finally, an on-demand presentation will be available after the event, and you will receive a link via email. So, DNS security issues are enough of a problem that DNS vendors, both open source and proprietary, as well as DNS operators, launched an event around the topic called DNS Flag Day. As we come up on the one-year anniversary of the event, it's clear there's plenty more work to be done. Bad actors are out there every moment of every day using DNS to try and capture or manipulate legitimate web traffic. They're gleaning credentials or email addresses from DNS traffic, they're launching denial of service attacks, and they're simply taking advantage of a technology that, while important and useful, still dates back to 1980s. This is why today our expert will discuss how DNS plays a part in your overall security posture and risk mitigation, as well as giving us an overview of specific DNS-related threats and vulnerabilities along with their tangible business impact. And so today, we're actually really honored that Cisco Umbrella is sponsoring our webinar. Cisco Umbrella is a security, cloud security platform that provides the first line of defense against threats on the Internet wherever users go. Because it's built into the foundation of the Internet, Umbrella delivers complete visibility into Internet activity across all locations, devices, and users. By analyzing and learning from this activity, Umbrella automatically uncovers attacker infrastructure stage for current and emerging threats, and proactively blocks requests before a connection is established. With Umbrella, you can stop phishing and malware infections earlier, identify already infected devices faster, and prevent data exfiltration. And because it's delivered from the cloud, Umbrella provides an effective solution that's open, automated, and simple to use. And so with that, I would like to introduce our expert, Kevin Beaver. Kevin is an information security consultant, expert witness, writer, and professional speaker with Atlanta-based Principal Logic LLC. Having more than 31 years of experience in the industry and 25 years focusing on security, Kevin specializes in performing independent security assessments of web applications and network systems. He has written 12 books on information security, including Hacking for Dummies and The Practical Guide to HIPAA Privacy and Security Compliance. In addition, he's a creator of Security on Wheels information security audiobooks and blog providing security learning for IT professionals on the go. And with that, let's get started. Kevin, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. All right. Thanks a bunch, Karen. I appreciate the intro. You always uh, cue things up so nicely and, and make my job easier, so uh, much appreciated. And uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. You know, we're seeing more and more uh, challenges as it relates to technical and human vulnerabilities related to desktop and laptop computers, mobile devices, and even servers. And I'd like to take just a few minutes to discuss what, what I think is one of the greatest vulnerabilities in terms of security incidents at the endpoint, uh, along with malware infections, uh, the network compromises, data breaches, and all that that come along with them. Some things that I'm seeing in my work, some mistakes that I'm witnessing, some that I've made, uh, and, and most importantly, some ways to go about locking things down the way they need to be. Does that sound like a good goal? Okay, sounds good. Sounds good to me. <laughs> awesome. Um, so a hockey great Wayne Gretzky once said, uh, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. And I think that applies nicely to what we're talking about today. If you're going to stay ahead of the curve or at least do your best to keep up with the bad guys, you're going to have to think about the bigger picture, how the decisions that you're making today will impact your security outcomes in the future. This usually doesn't involve spending a ton of money on new security initiatives uh, or reworking the business, uh, business workflows, processes, uh, policies, all that stuff. Really, all that's required is, is discipline and some, some common sense, um, some, some, hopefully some common sense things that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and, and 
and it's so it, it's it's really it's discipline uh, and, and common sense on your part and and your colleagues in IT and security, but it's also on the part of executive management. So that that's always a a, a big uh, critical aspect of any security program. I I consult with a lot of clients over various industries, both large organizations and and smaller ones, medium sized ones, um, and almost all of them have challenges across their environments. There are lots of opportunities for improvements uh, in, in security in terms of people, uh, business processes, and of course the, the computers and the software that they run and the networks that they run on. And you know, being an outsider, I get to sort of come in and, and have a fresh perspective of and, and, and see and witness what's going on and, and hopefully provide some, some guidance to get their security programs on track. And, and it's interesting to me. I, I, I don't think I've ever come across an organization that doesn't have documented security policies. The problem is they're documented and then they're put aside and they're not made part of day-to-day -day business operations. They're just a checklist item that the auditors might see, but no one really references and especially end users don't really know about. And that's a big problem. Similarly, on the technical side, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's safe to say really that most organizations who want to prevent security breaches and, and security incidents, you know, generally speaking, things like ransomware infections and the exposure of sensitive customer information or intellectual property, I think it's safe to say that most people want to do the right thing. Most people are are headed in that trajectory. They just need a, a, a little bit of guidance because maybe they're 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 a, a few degrees off uh, from from the goal that they really need to be aiming for. And you know, uh, uh, most organizations that I've seen that I've consulted with will, will go and spend good money on things like anti-malware software, uh, host firewalls, network firewalls, and intrusion detection systems. You know, data backup technologies, cloud services, all the stuff that we sort of we're used to seeing and buying and using uh, in and around IT, still so many times I see people just sort of going through the motions to check a box and say that they have this or that security control. And in reality, all, all of this under-implementation is doing is just creating a false sense of security. I think it's creating a false sense of security on the part of you know, the technical professionals, but it's also on the part of management because management in many cases doesn't know any better. They're just, they're, they're listening to what IT and security teams are telling them and they, they, they're they basically making their decisions or their assumptions on what might be considered bad information or skewed information because uh, of the way that these technologies are not implemented. Uh, or the way that they, they are implemented, or maybe I should say they're not implemented. Um, either way, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think you, you get my point. So what does DNS security have to do with all this? Well, let, let's shift gears for a minute and talk briefly about uh, DNS and how it can fit into your overall security program. So DNS, or domain name system, is the glue that sort of holds everything together in terms of how our networks work and communicate. And if you've been working in IT, for any period of time, you've no doubt had to deal with uh, the domain name system uh, to get your business online, to get your internal networks uh, talking and, and everything sort of flowing. Um, DNS is it's used by most, if not all, systems on your network, and it's responsible for translating you know, the, the people-friendly domain names that we're used to seeing into specific IP addresses um, across the Internet so that the systems basically know how to communicate with one another, and you can see some examples that I have here. Um, the, the 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 easy to understand, the easy to read names for Cisco, Ziff Davis for my own business. Um, at least when I uh, when I uh, pinged them, that's the, these are the, uh, the the IP addresses that they resolve to. So what you're seeing on the left is, of course, the 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 people friendly DNS version of, of that name and then their associated IP address so that the, the other systems that uh, they need to communicate with or that need to communicate with them will know how to uh, connect. 
Um, and there are DNS concepts that are great to understand. There's a lot of stuff uh, associated with just with that one protocol, with that one system. Um, things like recursive versus authoritative uh, registrars and the, and the whole process of DNS resolution, how it happens on the Internet and even inside your network. Cisco has a great webinar on these essentials that I recommend you check out. Just Google the title of the webinar and you can see it right here on the slide. It's called Meet Your New Best Friend DNS Security. Um, they do a great job of, of presenting uh, you know, a more in-depth look of, of how DNS works, and I, I wanted I didn't want to get uh, too far off uh, in, into that and, and talk more about DNS security and, and, again, how it fits into your security program. So it, it's hard to quantify, and I'm not sure that anyone could possibly quantify it, but I'm confident in saying that there are billions of DNS requests taking place on the Internet every day. Billions of requests going out to the, you know, out out to the web, out to uh, business partners, to clients, to, it, and all that stuff is taking place between workstations, servers, uh, mobile devices, network infrastructure devices, Internet of Things systems, and, and so on. And here's the real challenge: we have a tendency to forget just how complicated the networks we manage really are. The, the DNS-related threats and vulnerabilities associated. Uh, you know, with, with with all of this, are, are largely misunderstood. It's it's really not unlike modern day desktops that we're using. If if you were to load up, say, Windows Task Manager, or or a tool like the Microsoft Process Explorer, um, it's fascinating what our computers are doing. There, there's so much taking place in the background without our knowledge, and oftentimes without our consent. And in the context of DNS. It's creating or at least facilitating some business risks in the form of users getting tricked, uh, redirection to malicious sites, and the ultimate uh, potential uh, compromise of your systems if you're not adequately protected. So as it relates to security, I'm always looking to get the highest level of efficiency for the least amount of investment, and I suggest you do the same. Uh, th this is where establishing some controls around DNS requests and DNS management can really pay off. And get this, uh, Cisco found that 91% of malware can be blocked at the DNS layer. I had no idea it was that high. I knew it was high, and I knew it was a, a, a great way to to uh, to protect networks, you know, at, at that level, at that layer. But had no idea it was 91%. And if you look at the progression of a DNS-related compromise, it's very predictable. The first step is an outside threat looking to exploit an internal vulnerability on your network, you know, the, the latter of which often has hair on top. Um, the, the second phase is sort of the, the human gullibility that opens up this cascade effect in, in terms of the threat uh, being able to get through any existing security controls at the cloud layer, the network perimeter, and even directly on the endpoints. Next. You then have a, a user or multiple users who are making security decisions on your behalf. That is, they've received an, uh, received an email or a similar inbound request. They think that it's okay to interact with that message, including following the instructions that are included in that message, such as opening attachments, clicking links, and so on. And we all know what the outcome can be. If you're lucky, it may just be that the user clicks the link and opens an attachment. Uh, and the system happens to be fully patched or there's some other compensating control and, and therefore it's immune to the attack. The next worst thing could be that the user divulges sensitive information such as network login credentials. And it's interesting, I, I'm able to get uh, login credentials from users in literally every phishing campaign that I run. Not because I'm good, just because the users are that expedient and they're not thinking about what they're doing. Uh, and, and quite possibly, the, the worst thing that can happen is that the user goes through all these motions and the outcome is malware that infects or encrypts the local computer or the entire network. So looking at the most bang for your buck principle, it just makes sense to, to nip this threat and these vulnerabilities in the bud as quickly as possible and as far away from the end point as possible. And that's where having good controls around DNS lookups and DNS management can really pay off. So let's talk more about your security program and where DNS security fits in. 
DNS impacts both sides of the security equation. I do a lot of security assessments and virtual CISO consulting, and I found that most security challenges can be categorized into one of these two areas, technical security and operational security. And the, the vulnerabilities and risks associated with both sides uh, usually go hand in hand. It's, it's people and processes, it's policies and things like patch management, data backups, uh, and, and so on. So th there are so many things that you can do to improve an information security program when you look at just these two areas. But what we often see are gaps and oversights in one of these areas, often both, which almost always sends things sideways in terms of incidents and breaches, and that, that's what I see. I, I, I deal w with a, uh, a, quite a few situations. I don't do as many incident response type projects. It's, I, I mostly try to do the more proactive security assessment work, but occasionally I'll get involved in some incident response efforts, and it's always one of these things. Sometimes it's both, and, and like I said, they, they often go hand in hand. It's, an, it's a, an oversight or an assumption on one side, uh, and, and therefore the other side doesn't get fully implemented or um, properly overseen. So it, it, it's complicated, but it's also kind of simple. So where should you be in terms of security maturity, risk mitigation, and risk tolerance, especially in the context of DNS security? Well, it's a tough question to answer given all the variables. It's, it's easy for us technical folks to sort of look at security as a binary function you know, you have security or you don't. It's the, there's the, you have secure practices or you don't. It's, <clears throat> it's all black and white, and I think it's because we tend to think in uh, digital like that. But there's also reality. There are so many things that impact an overall information security program, like what industry your business operates in, which information assets you're responsible for, regulatory requirements, uh, your budget, your in-house security expertise, uh, customer and business partner expectations and demands. And of course, you have complexities involving your people, your processes, and your systems. So there are a lot of things that ultimately define how security looks in your organization. And if, if I could provide one simple answer uh, to this question, it would be that your, your security program needs to be exactly where it needs to be, all based on reliable information, having the right people involved, good decision-making, and so on. I, I can't tell you how many organizations that I've seen have a quote-unquote security program. They have all these technologies, all these policies and processes, a security awareness and training program, but they've never, not even once in years or decades, performed an information risk assessment. They've never either done it themselves or had someone else come in to look to see where things actually stand. and. There's no way that you could possibly implement anything well if you don't understand what your risks are, if you don't understand where your targets uh, are and where you need to focus your efforts. So to answer that question, yeah, it's not very simple, but it, it, it needs to be where it needs to be, and I think only you will know that assuming you're doing all the right things. So what, I've, uh, what I have here is just some questions that you can ask yourself to determine where you really need to be. Um, th th this is a great exercise to sit down with your colleagues in IT and security, to sit down with executive management, you know, maybe the CIO and CTO, but ideally someone else that has uh, buy-in. Maybe it's the CFO, the chief risk officer, maybe it's the uh, maybe it's legal counsel, somebody else from you know outside of your IT circles that can help with this, that, 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 that can also, you know, sort of help make decisions that are in the best interest of the, for, for the business at large and not just IT and security. And it's asking yourself, yourselves, I guess, uh, what's the goal? What is it we're, we're, uh, we're, we're aiming for? Is it 100% security? <laughs> that, that's, you, you'll never reach that, you know that, but it, it, is it, is it to meet some compliance initiatives? Is it to be the best that we can be, given our circumstances? Um, you got to have a documented goal. Uh, what standards do you have, and what requirements must you meet? If you don't have standards, if you don't have you know core 
uh, elements of your program that, you know, this is how we do things here, these are our standards, oh, and we have some written policies that reference those standards. Um, and, and then again, what requirements are others making us meet? Or maybe even you have your own internal requirements just because it's the right thing to do, um, because you have a board member that is highly technical, that, that works for a technology company and knows exactly what needs to be done in terms of security. There, there, there's a lot of moving parts here, but you need to understand that. Um, and it, you need to understand where the gaps are and what the tangible business risks are. This is where you know, coming in and doing a, um, a formal security assessment it could just be vulnerability and penetration testing. Ideally, it's vulnerability and penetration testing and looking at your IT operations to, to sort of form a, an overall information risk assessment and, and outcomes in that area. Again, so that you can see which side of the security equation that you're on, at least in terms of your overall risks. Um, there are some, some additional questions that I have here, th these last uh, last four that are have sort of a positive focus to them, and I think that's great because it, it makes you think um, a little more clearly and a little, little perhaps a little differently than what you're used to thinking. But it's, hey, what are we doing well? You know, surely we're doing something well. What is that? Maybe it's technologies. Maybe it's Maybe you have good DNS security. Maybe you have good endpoint security, but you have some weaknesses on the implementation or the oversight side of things. Um, what do we need to start doing differently? <clears throat> You'll know what that is. You probably already know. Hopefully one of them is to shore up your DNS security and uh, better protect those endpoints. Um, what could or what should be our mitigation plan in order to get to that endpoint? And then... What else could we be doing? That's a great question to ask. What else? What else? There's always something else that you can be doing. And again, it doesn't have to be that expensive. It doesn't have to be anything that's sort of out of the ordinary, that's going to turn you on your side, that's going to get in the way of your users doing business. Um, but there's always something else. And I think that that's, that's probably the most important question that you, that you could ask yourself. And, you know, the statistic that, uh, from Cisco that I mentioned, 91% of malware can be blocked at the DNS layer. Well, having the proper security around DNS allows you to implement and automate your controls so that you can focus on your highest payoff tasks. And your highest payoff tasks should be something similar to what uh, I have on the slide here. Enforcing your policies, increasing your visibility, and then setting your users up for success. Of course, there's a, there, there are more depending on what aspect of security we're talking about. We're talking about DNS security and endpoint security, you know, web-related security. So in, enforce, increase, and set up for success. Um, these things, they're going to help you get your security program on track and make sure that a simple oversight is not what brings your network down. And you simply look at this using the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. You figure out what is most valuable in the context of overall security and then drilling down what's most valuable and vulnerable in the context of DNS security and malware as it relates to your endpoints. You'll find that 20% of the gaps and opportunities you identify are creating 80% of your risks. And it, it will be so crystal clear to you, I can assure you, that you're going to wonder why you haven't looked at, at it this way before now. And that's the neat thing about the Pareto Principle. It, it really a, allows you to focus your efforts in the right direction and address the biggest security challenges you face in a straightforward manner rather than you know, getting distracted by the latest hype. And my goodness, we have a lot of uh, hype in this industry. So you've got to make sure you're uh, headed in the right direction. So to make my points another way, the more time you spend keeping your DNS-related risks in check, the greater your returns uh, will be in terms of your overall security program and the lower the risks. So I want to leave you with two thoughts regarding DNS security that uh, and, and really how it fits into your overall security program and how you can get better really starting today. So my first thought, if you want to run an effective and efficient security program, one of your primary goals needs to be 
doing what it takes to set your users up for success, and this will in turn set your business up for success. So how do you do this? You absolutely positively have to keep people from making security decisions that can lead to negative outcomes wherever you possibly can. And you can do this in a relatively simple and automated fashion using DNS security controls. The last thing that you need as an, as an IT or security professional or business executive, business owner, is people out there being fooled into doing something and, and, and expecting a certain outcome on your behalf without you ever knowing about it, without you having any sort of say-so or control over it. So that's a big one. My second thought, in the end, you have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing going to be defensible in the event of an audit or worse, in the event of an, uh, of an incident or breach? A lot of security incidents and most breaches end up in the laps of lawyers. So this is one of the most important things to consider as it relates to your security. Is your own lawyer willing to defend what you're doing? And how is an opposing lawyer going to look at what you're doing and pick it apart to make you and your business look bad. And, and ultimately, what's going to happen if a judge or a jury or a mediator uh, looks at this? And, and, and you know, when the going gets rough, how, how is it all going to look? Is it going to be defensible? I strongly believe that the only way to have a solid, resilient, and defensible enterprise information security program is to acknowledge the weaknesses and the gaps in your DNS security at your endpoints and across your network and take reasonable steps to address them. So with that, I'm going to take a moment and be quiet while I turn it back over to Karen for the Q&A. Karen? Great. Thanks so much, uh, Kevin. Great information in there. A lot, Thank you. Uh, a lot to think about. So it's time for our Q&A. So I know that we've been having some questions come in while you've been talking, but if you're out there and you haven't asked a question, this is your opportunity to ask a question and get it answered live. So to do so, just go ahead and put your question into that question box on the left side of your screen. And again, we do have some great questions here from the audience. So let's jump right in. Um, why don't we take this first one from Chris? So Chris says, "How do you change? <clears throat> excuse me. How do you change culture so that management actually uses the security policies that they document?" <laughs> well, um, culture doesn't come from IT or security. I mean, you can educate, you can evangelize, you can you can sort of uh, push your ideas around the organization, but ultimately culture comes from leadership. And that leadership, well, you know who that is. It's, it's executive management. It's, it's the people in charge making the decisions and whatnot. And, and I have seen that in, in certain organizations quite a few actually, where management or someone on the board, legal counsel, who, whomever, they, they just get security and they hold themselves accountable to reasonable security standards. So if they're, um, you know, if, if they're basically, if they're having, if they, if they have security policies but they're not being enforced or properly implemented, then, then uh, it, it's got to go up the food, food chain, so to speak. It's, you've got to you, you've, you, uh, you've got to get the messages out, but there's only so much you can do, and it, it's you know it's really about networking and, and and hoping that leadership will will see the light, so to speak. Okay, great. Well, uh, let's see. We have quite a few other questions here. Why don't we go to this one from Jennifer? Jennifer says, "I've heard IoT devices complicate DNS security even more. Is this the case?" And if so, what should I do? Because we are implementing a lot of IoT devices. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 IoT certainly certainly complicates everything. <laughs> um, and and I've always believed that you can't secure the things that you don't acknowledge. So there's no reasonable way to um, to get IoT under control unless and until you pull those devices under your you know your your umbrella of oversight and control, and a good a good way to do that is via DNS. You're certainly not going to be able to lock every IoT system down. You're, you're most of the time you're going to be at the mercy of the vendors um, that 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 actually make these devices, and or you may not even know about them at all. So better to to extend your 
control out as far away from the network as possible so that everything, again, under that umbrella, no pun intended, and can be controlled and, and properly managed. Okay, great. Let's see. So this one comes from John. So John says, how common is farming these days? I keep hearing about it. Is it something I should be worried about? Yeah, absolutely. It's, so farming is basically when uh, the website's traffic is, is redirected uh, to, to another site that's, that's mimicking uh, the, the original. And it's a great way to get people to, to click, divulge information, do whatever, and a uh, good, good way to sort of compromise everyone that's, that, that comes to the site. You know, lo looking at this from sort of a holistic perspective, I, I see security vulnerabilities that that uh, impact this at, at the web layer, at the application layer. I see, you know, vulnerabilities that can be exploited. I, I see, I see, um, <clears throat> you know, just network host layer uh, uh, vulnerabilities at the operating system. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen. But if DNS is compromised and DNS is somehow uh, redirecting that traffic, then absolutely it, it, it can have a, a pretty severe impact. We There have been some high-profile farming um, incidents and, and sort of takeovers, I guess is the best uh, word, that, that we've seen over the years, but it, it's certainly a, a threat and a vulnerability. Okay. Uh, let's see. So this is another question. Um, this actually comes from Frank. Frank says, we've discussed 100% DNS uptime goal for 2020. How realistic is this, and what are some of the tools that we can use to make this happen? So 100% DNS uptime, realistic. Um, yeah, I, I think it can happen. It depends on your infrastructure. It depends on how you, who you're re relying on. Do you have a, a sole DNS provider? Is it distributed? Is it, is it local? Is, is it, you know, th this is where some of the, the, the recursive versus authoritative uh, concepts, the, the name resolution, all that stuff come in, comes into play that, that Cisco uh, does a good job in, in that other webinar that I mentioned. Um, yeah, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's possible. Um, we, we've, we've certainly seen some big attacks and some you know, denial of service um, issues and whatnot on DNS providers in recent years, and, and it's certainly a possibility that's, that something like that could still happen. But Again, it's it, how is it architected? Is there a single point of failure? Um, are, are there are there backup plans? And, and of course, you know all of this is something that you would want to include in your your incident response plan and even your business continuity plan. And uh, work with your vendors to uh, to see what's uh, what's what, to see how they they may able to, may be able to help. And and uh, if you build it up from from that angle, you know, making sure that you define your requirements and then see how vendors can help and see how uh, other people or, or see how your actual network environment is um, is, is architected. I, I think that that's really how you build in resilience at this level. Um, so Kevin, we're actually past the um, half hour point. Um, so we have one more question and then maybe we'll let everybody get back to their day. And for anyone who asked a question and didn't get an answer, we'll make sure that you get an answer after the fact. So, um, so this actually comes from uh, Jeff, and Jeff says, what I see is big companies and governments getting hit with denial of service attacks. Does that mean that smaller companies don't have to worry as much about it? No, no. I, I, I think it's just the opposite. I think smaller companies are the ones that are being used to, uh, to abuse the bigger companies. There are a lot of smaller organizations that, that uh, have vulnerabilities on their networks that can be, um, that can be exploited. Um, and and you know for for ill-gotten gains or or to launch attacks you know distributed denial of service attacks against larger targets and and that's often how it works and it's not just the fact that you're basically a conduit for for these attacks smaller businesses can you know I I have a small business and I have um, I have quite a few business assets including my web presence, but of course my network hosts and, and other things like that, and not to mention all the information assets on the, on the uh, other side. And it's, I have a ton to lose. I have a lot to lose, and I, I certainly would not want anything like this uh, taking place, whether it's denial of service or, or anything else. It could be you know, web exploits. It could be ransomware. It could be whatever. And yeah, there's a... Um, 
it's a big uh, big challenge. So large or small, I think it's really all the same. Okay. Well, Kevin, uh, we're actually at the end of our time together. So I'd like to thank you so much for your presentation. And I'd also like to thank everyone else for joining us today for our special web event, How to Leverage DNS to Get Your Security Program Under Control. I am Karen Bannon, and on behalf of Kevin Beaver, Cisco Umbrella, and everyone at the Ziff Davis B2B Family of Publications, thank you for your time, and have a great day.